Now we are moving deeper into placing ground control points. I've mentioned them uh, during the last lecture, so if you need to remind what are they and how can they look like, uh, you have to go back to the previous lecture and slides about ground control points. Now we're going to say, like, what is the uh, grant control point survey and how to conduct it to have uh, then to make it the, mo the best use of it in the data processing process. So the uh, minimum recommended uh, grant control points is five. Why is that? It is like a rule of thumb that you need to have the area it depends on the shape of your area, but have it in each corner and then have one pin in the middle. That's uh, that's the minimum recommended minimum. Uh, but five or ten to ten are usually enough. It depends a lot on your project, and I'm going to mention it later. But just putting them, uh, putting a lot of GCPs makes you just. Um, have longer time for measuring them and doesn't improve the quality of the end results. It also the number of GCPs you can get it worth an experience and seeing the area. Oh, I need a ground control point here. After you process so many data and know where are the uh, where the largest errors are. So in cases, for example, when topography is complex, when you have steep slopes uh, that can be, uh, or when you get uh, sharp uh, sharp edges and you would like to have them correctly oriented, it is uh, it is advised to use more GCPs, even like in the small part of the mapping area where the topography or the features are more diverse. So uh, more important that the number of GCPs is the distribution. So they should be distributed pretty evenly. It doesn't have to be measured, but just not you will put five GCPs and you put them all here or even all in the middle. It's going to be not enough. But uh, or even if you put 10 or 15, but just in the middle, it's not enough. But five well distributed will be OK. Important feature, do not place them exactly on the edge of the mapped area because um, as you will see with the overlap, the biggest overlap is in the middle of the area. So the all of the area that you want to be mapped will have higher overlap. But at the edges, it can be just overlap at one, two pictures. If the ground control point appears only on two pictures, most of the software will not recognize it as a valid GCP. So it needs to be pinned. It needs to pin the most pictures possible. Usually, if you have it somewhere in the middle and the overlap is like 80%, 60, 80%, you will have, you will have, it will be visible on even up to 20 photos, nine minimum. So if you put it at the, at the edge, there is a higher probability that it's not going to be visible for so many photos. This is how uh, the ground control point can look like. Uh, if you're looking for more suggestions, you can find ready to buy panels in the Internet. You can also paint them like anything that will have recognizable middle point that you can measure uh, will do its job. Of course, it is also about the uh, um, the quality, if you, how many times do you want to use it, and how big the target should be. And we're going to talk about it uh, now. So before you even measure it, uh, you need to define the coordinate system. You need to also know with what accuracy is needed for this ground control points. I mentioned before that uh, some of the GPS um, receivers like the ones that are in our phones or just the simple handheld uh, handheld G, uh, GPS that can have accuracy up to just a couple meters. It's not enough uh, for the high resolution mapping. So you need to know what kind of device you need to use for uh, for your GCP survey. It's it's here. If if it's the handheld GPS there are some that are measuring with pretty high accuracy it can be totally enough or maybe you will need more sophisticated um, equipment like total station 
Now, uh, more about the accuracy. You can see here what's going to be explained the uh, the factors that are uh, defining accuracy. So the final results. You can here see here the picture, the pixels of your picture that has been taken, and also what is each pixel representing? What is their actual size on the ground? So the ground sampling distance of the images is just what's depicted here. The distance, like how large is the pixel or the middle of, of one pixel to the cars, to the neighboring pixel. If this is how how what is the distance on the ground grand sample distance if it's an inch we are thinking about oh we have an inch resolution and this is what the ground sampling distance is it's what is the pixel size or the distance from middle of, uh, of the one pixel to another middle in the real life when, now, when you know what's your grand, desired ground sampling distance, you have to uh, take it into account when you will be designing targets for GCPs and uh, assessing what would be your uh, the best accuracy that you need. First, if your grand sample uh, distance is one inch, so you want one pixel in your image, in your uh, final order photo, to represent one inch in real life, you need to think about the target size at least uh, five, 10 inches, but recommend it to be a little bit more uh, because you just want to see it on the picture. If you want, the, if something is just as small as five pixels, it's sometimes hard to detect it or how, how to, hard to establish what is actually in the middle of that. So our targets that we're going to be using were going to be much bigger uh, and our uh, for next week fight and our uh, uh, GSD will be about uh, an inch or inch and a half. Next thing, if you are thinking about accuracy, it needs to be at least 10% uh, of your grand sampling dif distance. So again, if it's uh, if it's one inch, uh, you need to have uh, a millimeter, two, three millimeters accuracy of your um, of your uh, G GPS. Now a little bit more about this ground sampling distance. The flight planning software will frequently ask you to define one, and it will uh, then calculate uh, different geometrical parameters of the flight. So the, the bigger the, the ground sampling di distance is, the lower the spatial resolution of the final uh, outputs. So if your GSD will be one inch, uh, then the uh, spatial re the resolution will be one inch. If your GSD will be bigger, so two inches, then one pixel will represent two inches in uh, on the art of photo. So it is the lower spatial resolution. The GSD depends on multiple factors. It depends on the flight altitude. So the higher you fly, the more, the bigger area is visible on your, on one picture. So the larger is the ground sampling distance. But it also depends on the focal length of the camera. You can see you can have a smaller focal length and then uh, these rays, the angles will be different. So also you will capture more or less of the area. And then depending on your camera resolution, you can fit in between that as many pixels as your camera resolution uh, will, uh, um, will stand for. Now we are moving to the next phase, which is we are already getting out of the lab and we are going to the side. What is the first thing you should do? Our flight plan in the software is ready, which is go there and we press the button and fly. 
There are multiple things that need to be uh, done before you even start flying. First, if you arrive to the terrain, especially if you've never been there before, you just planned it in the, um, in the lab, you need to look around. You need to look for high obstacles in the takeoff and mission and landing areas. Also, during the flight planning um, process in the software, you should be uh, able to use the alternative landing location options. Already decide in the lab when would be the best place if anything happens, any emergency landing uh, or the landing, the first landing location will become suddenly inaccessible. You need to also take to account this alternative landing location and check there for obstacles or for other terrain features that will um, make it uh, um, not suitable for takeoff or landing. Also, you need to ask the, um, the locals first. In North Carolina, it is, uh, it is illegal to fly without notifying the owner. But sometimes, even if you know, if this is a public area, the local people can know much more about the traffic, uh, the air traffic there, or even about the ground activities. Maybe there is um, something going on around that you have no idea uh, of. So if, especially if you are in some populated area, uh, you of course, you're not planning over the people if you don't have a waiver, but it is, uh, better to have the, the knowledge of the people that live there because they know the area the most. Also, when you arrive, you have actually the, uh, the right information about the weather because no forecast can tell you as much as the real uh, data that you can gather in the terrain. So you are all, it's not a decision only fly or not to fly. If it's raining, obviously we're not flying. If it's too windy, you check the wind, it's like too windy, okay, we're not flying. But also some things like that, the, the temperature will affect your body, your life. It's really, really cold outside. You're, you may not be able to execute the whole flight because the battery really, uh, will just die earlier. Um, also, the most of the UAS can operate in rain some of them, the fixed wind will take like small drizzle and if it will not affect your uh, data quality, maybe it's it's okay. You need to look into the manufacturer's manual. They usually advise not to fly, um, maybe if, from with the exception of some uh, waterproof UAS. But if you are having um, self-built uh, frame, that's not covered with, with any protection. You might even consider not flying in a really high humidity or if it's uh, like a little bit foggy because it can influence your, um, uh, the, the um, functioning of your UAS. Then there is a really important thing that was developed by aviation professionals and is now right now used in the UAS community too it's checklists. So not what you what should be done, what I remember that should be done, but have actual piece of paper or its electronic version that you will go over and you will need to check each thing for the millionth time uh, and before each flight. It's, uh, it's easier now because you don't have to develop anything uh, by yourself. You have uh, paper forms, uh, some of the manufacturers will uh, make them, some of the communities, uh, UAS communities develop there and share. Uh, there are also apps that will uh, will go through the checklist process with you. you just tap, like I've done that, I've done that. It, it, will, uh, it will establish the routine for you. Here I open for you the link with the phantom checklist. So you can see here it's uh, hardware specific. So it says like, oh, if it's the status light is flashing green because it's how the phantom operates. And if you go through that all, you're ready for, for the flight. Um, there is also the app that I mentioned. You, it's accessible, uh, available or on iTunes. Uh, that will not only go through through the whole checklist, but also check if, uh, based on your location, if you are in what class um, of the airspace are you in, it will um, 
um, it will also let you uh, customize the checklist that uh, you have according to your UAS uh, model or your needs.